Um, thanks, everyone. I'm so sorry I'm late. Um, uh, I love trains, but uh, there was like a two-hour delay, so I was supposed to be here this morning, and unfortunately, just just got here moments ago. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit more granularly. Uh, you know, I saw the slides, and obviously there have been some uh, amazing talks so far. Um, those that I missed, I'm going to watch, and I'm really excited to chat with you all later. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, Bacco Yao, uh, the project we launched uh, at Protocol Labs um, in the open source, and has uh, gotten a huge amount of uptake, and uh, we've been really excited with it. Um, and it's all in the frame of what we call universal and reproducible compute. So what does this mean? Um, you know, for better or worse, and again, there are lots of like, um, uh, you know, subtle definitions here. Uh, universal means runs the same, or runs everywhere, excuse me, and reproducible means runs the same. And I have the asterisk there, I'm well aware, you know, perfect reproducibility is impossible because the world is not deterministic. Uh, yet, you know, I think we can make a lot of progress from where we are today. Um, you know, you kind of, uh, I kind of like to start with this, you know, who am I to be talking about these things? Um, it, it's interesting. I've kind of like gone from the like major hyperscale cloud companies. I've been involved with some very deep open source projects. Uh, I led Kubernetes and, and I started Kubeflow and things like that. And so I have a sense of like being a little bit at the center of the Venn diagram of what commercial is looking for around these kind of things. And then what open source is often looking for is, uh, around these things as well. Uh, but not just that, um, you know, I started my career uh, at the NIH. So I also have some awareness of academia. Again, I didn't, uh, you know, I, I collected a salary from them, but I like didn't have to go get a PhD or anything. So I, I'm not saying I'm an academic uh, and I, I feel for them, but I certainly know what it was like. And I like to call back there because when, when I was there, um, we would do these uh, very large PET scans at the time, uh, PET scans, fMRIs and things like that, uh, which was pretty revolutionary. And the data was enormous for the time, right? You're talking about like 10 gigabytes, my God, you know, in insane. Um, and, and this was the actual URL, right? I have some of this stuff sitting around on my machine and, and this is what it looked like, right? It was an FTP site. It was like hosted on NIH.gov. Uh, now this was all internal stuff. Nobody had any concept of sharing data beyond, um, you know, do, pr publishing a paper, but it was often just a tarball, gzipped tarball and, and that was it. So. Um, in prep for this talk, I went and I was like, okay, well, what's state of the art? And yeah, I went to Amazon's uh, open data repository, and this is it. And it's basically the exact same thing. And we are decades beyond that. I, I, I know I look very young, but no, I'm very old. Uh, decades beyond this. I, yet, um, uh, you know, almost nothing has changed for the majority of it, which is so strange because here we are at IPFS camp with so much knowledge and wisdom and, and power around things like content address IDs and ways to be much more flexible at, at uh, reproducing and unequivocally identifying what data is being used. And, you know, one of the first questions is, well, it worked then, kind of works now, what's the problem? Well, there are lots of problems, right? Um, security, right? Uh, things are hosted all very often on HTTP. Sure, okay, it went over SSL, but exactly how secure was it? What were your ACLs? How do you swap? What was your token? What's the limit of use of it as you download it? Things like that. Um, it's often self-managed. Uh, people get you know, just a bucket. Uh, whether or not you're internal to an organization or you're external, you'll just get a bucket and say like, okay, go nuts. And nobody's watching it. Nobody has any kind of um, uh, contract or data catalog or anything like that. A lot of times things are hosted on um, commercial endpoints. A lot, additionally, metadata is very often in the URL. So if you change the URL, congratulations, you change the metadata. Like, that's awesome. Um, and worse, this is probably the worst bit of the whole thing is it's completely non-deterministic, right? I could upload another file tomorrow that is something completely different, named the same, and now everything is gone, right? And there's no proof that any of that happened. So this is really a problem, and this really is the root of uh, collaboration and, and reproducibility, in my opinion. Don't get me wrong, there are many other steps, 
But the first step we have to agree on, especially in the days of ML and developing models and things like that, is, you know, what reproducible data looks like. And it, of course, gets much worse. You know, even if we wanted to keep up with moving data around and things like that, we couldn't. Data is growing way, way, way too fast. I'll breeze through a lot of this stuff because you, you probably already heard it before. Um, and like I said, reproducibility is not just about data. Uh, what code, what stack we're using, what drivers, can you examine the whole process that produced this paper, um, that produced this ultimate result? Where are you writing your metadata logs? Where are you writing your metadata logs as you progress or uh, um, move through the progress, uh, versions over time, things like that, and in what format? So how can we address it? Um, uh, this is the, these were some of the challenges we approached when we started uh, back at Yao. We were in uh, Portugal at uh, a different IPFS camp. Um, and we said, um, boy, you know, this is a really hard problem. And we came up with the idea that like, what, what the real problem here is, the root is, it's this idea of compute over data. Rather than moving the data at all, it should be available where it started. Uh, now, does that mean you don't move the data? No, but it means when you move it, you trace how it happens, um, which again is you know just perfect for things like blockchain and so on, where you have a, a consistent ledger that that permanently identifies how things move from place to place. And like I said, it can't just be about the data. It needs to be, well, this data was transformed by this compute process into this new data set, which was transformed into this new compute, or by this new compute process, so on and so forth. So you get a ledger that tracks everything along the way. Um, like I said, we kept calling it compute over data and abbreviating it um, as COD, COD, uh, which is how you come up with Bacayao. Uh, that's uh, the uh, Portuguese word for, for uh, COD. Um, now, a lot of people are like, well, I'm just going to go build this myself. It's not that hard. And in truth, you know, if you're a small or, or you're, you're just collaborating with one other person, it's probably not. But I really do counsel people against it because you get into this like very challenging situation where you don't realize how big a challenge you have. Uh, you think about your orchestration system. Your data scientist comes along and says, uh, sh she says, I'd like to run some data analysis on it. Um, and she's able to. She's able to push it to various locations and things like that. Um, and it works, except then immediately she turns around and says, well, I'd like to do these other things as well. And your poor developer, um, you know, wants a life or wants to go on vacation or wants to whatever. And this is where betting on a single commercial entity um, uh, developed by a single company is not ideal because you're all, always going to be constrained by the people you have available to you. Um, so... Instead of building it yourself, we propose building with a community. And this was the very start of Baka Yao. In, you use an open source compute over data platform. Again, we have one. We are working uh, as hard as we can to develop standards and processes so that we're not doing all this on our own. Uh, but even so, you can come use ours. You know, again, it's Apache 2, MIT licensed, fork it, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the, 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 um, it's available to you. Um, it's extensible, it's built for multi-cloud, it's built for non-data centers, it runs all the way down to whatever Raspberry Pis and, and uh, thermostats and things like that. Um, uh, we, we had it uh, to, a year ago, we had it running on somebody's phone, it was amazing. Um, and, and it's got all this built in by default. Like you don't have to do anything and you just get this. Reproducible execution, every single job has a CID associated with it. Every single input source can be a CID. It doesn't have to be. We actually support mounting from local drive or S3 buckets, but the moment it's in the system, we give it a CID. And then it produces an audit log and things like that. And also it supports isolation. So you can do all this alone. Uh, and then only at the end, publish it. This is not a SaaS platform that needs to reach into your data center in order to do these things. You can deploy it on your own. Uh, and for those sticking around for the workshop, I will be happy to show you and, and uh, demonstrate a, a bunch of really cool things. What does it look like to run a job? This is it. It really is, you know, there's nothing hidden here. This is a very, very simple uh, YAML. Like I said, um, uh, actually, you know, we support webhooks and other things like that. We support JSON, you name it, uh, as well as command line. Um, you give it, in this case, this person is uh, mounting in something from a local drive. Uh, they can use Wasm, they can use Docker, they can use any arbitrary binary that runs on your local machine. Um, as you see there, it, it, it can be data aware scheduling. So you can schedule across your entire network and say, oh, you know what, this big data set is over there. So run this on compute jobs that have access 
to that CID uh, with native integration into IPFS. Um, and it's repeatable. So uh, in this case, we're using a Docker, but Docker with a tag. Again, you don't have to use these things, but if you do it by default, we give that to you. And what it really does is unlock um, new forms of collaboration. How much time do I have? Oh, okay, great. All right, I, I won't go so fast anymore. Um, so one of the things that we, we talked about, and we just had a great talk about what collaboration really looks like, is something like this, right? So let's say you have your two data scientists in different organizations. They could be different um, uh, you know, academic institutions, they'd be commercial institutions. They could be within a single commercial institution that can't share for whatever reason. And uh, they both would love to collaborate, but when our data scientist in, in org B wants to get access to the data from org A, congratulations, you know, GDPR, right? Um, because you can't move the data. Uh, that is like built into so many of these regulations. Now, are we moving the data? Are we violating this stuff all the time? Yes. That doesn't mean it's right or good. And eventually, and you know, I mean, um, uh, in preparation for um, uh, spinning the company out, we did some research. It turns out there are about $250 billion worth of fines in aggregate applied to like industry worldwide around data, data management, data handling, uh, many of which are a result of like either moving the data, keeping data that you weren't supposed to, or letting someone else have the data when they shouldn't have it. Um, so the ability to control it and not move it is not just a regulation. It's because, you know, it, it can lead to really bad things. So our data scientist in org B is very unhappy now because she's not going to go through and sign that. She's not going to do all the lawyers and things like that. Um, and in org A, they don't want to take that, that challenge on. So this is where something like Bakayao, uh, where you're doing compute over data comes in. Again, this is all built into Bakayao by default. And again, if you're sticking around for the workshop, I'll show you how to do all this. Uh, it's very, very easy. Now what you get is org B says, um, great, I'd like to submit my job to you know, that data set over there. The person says, uh, great, submit your job. She takes her job, that YAML that we talked about earlier with container or anything like that, and she puts it into Bakayao where it sits in a secure enclave. Uh, so this is not executing, this is not doing anything, it's just sitting there with metadata attached. Our uh, scientist from org A can go look at it, ensure the job is okay to run, um, and says, yes, great, I know what this is. Or no, like, hey, you know what, you gave me an encrypted binary or something like that, that's not okay. I need to see this plus the hash. But regardless, there's a very simple gate there to allow someone to get access to that data or not. Uh, in this case, the, the data scientist didn't do anything malicious, so she says, fine that it moves from that secure enclave into a local compute cluster, which then processes over those local machines. Uh, and again, by local, I mean like, you know, coincident or whatever. It doesn't have to be, right? It could just be um, anything that, that no one else has access to in this particular scenario, runs the job, produces a set of results, which also go into a secure enclave. Our data scientist says, okay, let me go audit those things. Uh, all looks good, not exfilling, whatever, social security numbers, so on and so forth. Or you could use automated processes for this. The system is really, really flexible. Uh, it says thumbs up, ready to go. Uh, and then, and only then, does the person in org B get access to it. And so what you see here is the data never left org A, like with some arbitrary access, nor did person from org B have unlimited access in order to achieve this. Now you're like, okay, well, she needs to see schema and she needs to see metadata and catalogs. Yeah, it's not a panacea. Um, and there are lots of very easy ways to achieve this. And again, I'll show you how to do that um, uh, later when we're sitting down. But regardless, you can say to any auditor, any security person in the world um, that this didn't move. And how can you say that so assuredly? Well, it's because every single step that you saw there is automatically tracked in the system. That's what we are built for. So everything is tied together. You get a lineage for all these things. Everything gets a CID, you know, cryptographically, you know, verifiable that, that this is what produced it. Um, so, and that's basically the sum of Bakayao. Uh, it is designed to be a computer over data platform. It is designed to be community first. We have weekly office hours. We are open source, as I mentioned. We're uh, Apache 2 and MIT licensed. Yes, I work at a commercial company that is backing Bakayao. 
But that is not remotely. Like I said, I was first uh, PM on Kubernetes. I uh, started Kubeflow. I'm a huge proponent of, of uh, open source, and I want to make it successful. And and like I said, the only way it will be successful is if we um, uh, if we like come together as a community where we find key data sets and key users who have the problems that you saw here, and we can help solve them. And that's that. It truly is my passion.